Researchers and evaluators prefer qualitative research, also known as interpretism. Rather than have a correlational and statistical analysis known as quantitative, which is basically data collected through polls, questionnaires, surveys, or by manipulating pre-existing statistical data using computational techniques. Qualitative research understands patterns and relationships and conditionalities that affect interpretation of the analysis. The term family resemblance refers to various research approaches that fall under the qualitative umbrella, such as the one seen in the slide. They all share the view of social phenomena as dynamic composites in many participants' or stakeholders' perceptions and experiences strongly influenced by the context in which their experiences occur. They also tend to stay long enough at the site to appreciate and document multiple pers perspective, contexts, circumstances, and experiences. Qualitative evaluation offers an array of methodological approaches that often involve mixed methods. Quantitative studies are likely to be judged on the basis of fidelity to the research or evaluation design, but qualitative studies are likely to be judged on the basis of how insightful, well-warranted, and useful the interpretations are. The following are examples of using both methods. Qualitative study occurs in the term in situ, which is data collected at sites where relevant events naturally or ordinarily occur. For example, early education evaluations in the United States concentrated on quantitative data, often collected remotely and were heavily criticized by educators who complained that evaluators were judging them without having set foot in their schools. The importance of observing in natural settings where stakeholders engage in program activities make qualitative evaluation naturalistic. The term contextualized meaning refers to qualitative inquiries workers towards detailed, contextual, holistic portrayals of naturally occurring events and experiences. Qualitative evaluators recognize that unique contexts shape each program and its outcomes. And the following are the examples of what a contextual program might be, which within these systems, many types of contexts affect programs physically, socially, economically, legally, and much more. It also promotes the understanding of what program is able to accomplish under what circumstances and why. Data complexity and conflicts. Qualitative research looks to find all viewpoints and get a perspective from anyone who has or doesn't have one in an attempt to achieve a full understanding of the data. Quantitative is viewed as reductionist, which is an attempt to understand data and numbers to measure outcomes, support correlations, comparisons, trends, and probabilities, while qualitative is viewed as expansionist and attempts to understand the broad meaning of the data. In quantitative evaluations, turning experiences and perceptions into numbers can run the risk of objectifying participants. Qualitative evaluations, there's a little bit different issue in that it involves more interpersonal involvement with stakeholders, which sometimes can lead to discomfort in answering interview questions or being observed. An example of this is if you're willing to tell me who you voted for. Uh, qualitative research requires that we maintain good relationships with our participants and stakeholders. This allows us to receive answers that are honest and complete, and there's a couple different ways we could do that. The first way would be through collection conditions and making sure the environment is a neutral location and minimizing the factors that may cause discomfort to be considered disrespectful. The second way would be through understanding the culture and the third way would be through using local interpreters, translators, or guides. But with that we have to be careful that the bias of the person being used is not present in the interviews. The fourth way would be through using authority figures to mandate stakeholders to participate in data collections. We need to be aware that the participants and stakeholders could view this as being forced and provide inaccurate or passive information. The fifth way would be through repeated observations. Qualitative generalizations are seen as a sample to population generalization more for large scale, whereas qualitative generalizations are seen as a case-to-case -case generalization better for understanding unique instances. So your next question might be, what are the benefits of mixed method studies? Well, the main thing is that it offers a broad view that can explain trends and correlations while providing the understanding to why trends occur and how they operate. 
Validity seeks to answer, does the test measure what it's supposed to measure? Subjectivity is a factor that can influence validity by introducing a bias to the findings. One way we can limit our own subjectivity as evaluators is through triangulation, which involves deliberate attempts to confirm, elaborate, or disconfirm facts. Although some may hear triangulation and think it's referring to three of something in a process, it's actually using multiple methods, sometimes more than three, to check for accuracy and completeness. Qualitative researchers do this by including multiple data sources, multiple methods of data collection, or data over time, and using multiple perspectives. There are two forms of data validation. Member checking involves review of data by a selected group of persons who are relevant informants and stakeholders. These groups determine the accuracy of the data received and also reviews initial interpretations. Comprehensive validation involves reviews by each informant of the data collected by him or her and reviews draft findings. Emergent design. Qualitative design changes as researchers and evaluators learn about the programs they examine. Constant comparative model captures the essence of emergent design and is the process of planning, data collection, and analysis to evolve the design. Data collection. Qualitative research and evaluation involve three data collection methods. The first is observation, the second, interview, and the third, the review or analysis of documents or artifacts. Observation. Observations are needed to triangulate data collected using other methods. It allows researchers and evaluators to obtain evidence that confirms, disconfirms, or elaborates statements, evidence, or artifacts. Observations can be structured or unstructured. Unstructured observations avoid instrumentation bias, which is the misdirection of attention based on advanced focusing. Unstructured observations are usually always open-ended and are unencumbered by tally sheets or preset categories. Unstructured observations are the key to understanding the who, what, when, where, and why. Structured observations involve protocols that direct the observer to tally or record certain behaviors. Structure varies by the detail specified in an observation protocol. In structured observations, perception and interpretation are entwined. Um, lastly, in structured observations, reliability checking ensures that all observers record information similarly. Examples of protocol may be found in the second edition of the Real World Evaluation Text on pages 302 to pages 304, figures 13.1 to figure 13.3. Interviews. Interviews. There are three types of interviews, structured, semi-structured, and unstructured. The most favorable or typical type of interview is the semi-structured interview in which the question order can vary. The benefit of a semi-structured interview is that you can adjust the order and wording of questions. You maintain rapport with the person you're interviewing. You can assess follow-up or conversational lead questions that may yield unexpected information and it gives way to on-the-spot questions as well. Please reference page 308, figure 13.4 for guidelines in developing questions for interview protocols. A focus group or group interview is that you can gain more information in a shorter period of time. You have the potential to deepen the discussion by collaborative correction and also increase the accuracy of your data set. The downside is that they are difficult to arrange, difficult to manage, and some members may not participate or contribute as much as others. Tips to remember are that audio recording can be complicated, intrusive, and subject to technical difficulties, and videotaping may intensify feelings of discom discomfort or overexposure. Participant observation and cultural competency. Cultural competency is crucial in interviewing so that you can see the world through the eyes of the participant. External can be considered as a fly on the wall, whereas an internal interviewer uh, documents activity while fully immersed in participation. 
Besides interviews and observations, collecting and analyzing documents and artifacts produced and used by participants can foster understanding and provide information on the research. On page 287 in the older edition or page 311 in the new edition, you'll see a list with some pretty good examples of document and artifact data sources in topics of education and social sciences. Some of the benefits of looking for and using documents and artifacts is it may provide information that was not obtained through interviews or observations, or information about occurrences that happened prior to the arrival of the researcher. Another benefit is that it may save the researcher some money and time if they do have budget and time constraints. But do keep in mind that not all documents and artifacts are equally accessible. Some documents are classified or legally protected, like students' individualized educational plans. All data should be analyzed critically, especially self-reported documents, because participants would want to provide favorable work or present themselves in a good light. When analyzing documents, texts, or artifacts, the researcher should focus on how and for whom the artifact is created, what is included and not included in the document, and how the document is used. The data provided by participants should be analyzed with other data that was collected to ensure accuracy. With qualitative data, you can modify certain data collection methods to collect data. Listed here are several hybrid qualitative data collection methods. The first one is video stimulated interviews, which is when subjects view a video sequence and then they are asked to reflect on their thinking during the video event. It is a good method to use during focus groups because people would provide their interpretation and perspective on the subject matter of the video. Different perspectives could be helpful to the evaluator if they're trying to understand and interpret program outcomes. The second one is Think Aloud Interviews, which is a hybrid of observing and interviewing. The evaluator would be observing the participant as they're engaged in a task or doing something, and they will ask the participants to tell them what they're thinking as they're doing it. This provides some insight into the participants' decision making and rationales. The third one is arts-based research methods, which uses images, drawing, music, and metaphors to draw out certain types of information that was hard for the participant to articulate in the first place. The last one is technology. Using technology collection methods is helpful when the evaluator is not located at the study site or when face-to-face -face interviews cannot be conducted. Uh, but do keep in mind when using emails or discussion boards to collect data, the interviewee might revise their responses several times or decide at the end to leave out certain information before sending it over. This could skew the data. Well, this section covers data analysis, and data analysis pretty much talks about qualitative findings are being developed inductively. Uh, inductive analysis can be a dialogic effort to understand both details and the big picture to which they contribute. Qualitative findings um, are usually driven by content rather than procedure, and it involves the identification of patterns in the data from which we can gather understanding and construct interpretations. The interpretive process is not a clear series of steps, but more like reading and interpreting a complicated text. Here's a link to a YouTube video that offers um, some more writing advice and tips for when you're getting ready to write about your qualitative findings. Uh, thematic analysis covers micro and macro examination of data and the identification of emergent patterns and themes. Um, micro review promotes the recognition of important details uh, that may have barely been noticed during the data collection. Um, and it also identifies the relationship between the data and the themes. As patterns from the data collection emerge, um, important themes can start to be identified. The themes that emerge can help focus um, reorganization of the data set.
Identifying important themes uh, involves judgment, and the book places a big emphasis on us not being biased when we do so. Uh, however, they do talk about um, our one of our greatest challenges being recognizing our biases, which can be really difficult to do. So it's even harder to recognize and reduce. Then it goes on to talk about theoretical triangulation, which is the analysis of data from different the theoretical or conceptual vantage points. Uh, this can spur a deeper understanding and may surface an array of potential interpretations. So basically, um, a, a, you know, a group of different people will have um, different interpretations of the data and that can be uh, very useful for your writing. Uh, then the book goes on to talk about criteriality and basically in some evaluations uh, programs are judged against criteria. The criteria can be pre-specified by a funding agency or can be specified internally by clients or evaluators. Uh, criteria could emerge during the evaluation and that's very likely as factors and outcomes gradually become clear during qualitative evaluations. Uh, qualitative practitioners tend to be skeptical that criteria can be objective and that all criteria can be identified in advance. Preordinate criteria will focus data collection and analysis properly. Uh, superimposing common criteria can amount uh, to fitting square pegs into round holes. Uh, moving on to electronic data analysis. Um, this basically is the use of electronic tools used for the analysis of qualitative data. And the book is pretty much um, advising us to approach these with caution. Uh, these programs tend to underline the validity of your research in two ways. Number one is that the data is entered into, a computer, into it, the computer using categories during the data collection process. Um, this task usually occurs prior to the emergence of patterns and themes. So the initial codes and categories may be off target um, with what you've discovered. Recoding after the data collection would eliminate the saving of time and therefore making this um, tool a little less valid. Um, the second uh, issue is that the reliance on electronics undermines the qualitative analysis um, focus on minds on and content oriented approach. Uh, the dependence on this data retrieval decreases opportunity to fully analyze the data. And then lastly, electronic data analysis essentially lessens the depth of the analysis by the researcher. Reporting. Um, here, narrative is the approach that the book advises to take. And narratives have long been recognized as having the power to compete to convey a complexity uh, not easily attained in numerical and correlation presentation. As a result, uh, they can be more effective in promoting the utilization of findings. Narrative can help stakeholders understand rather than just explain. Um, the book talks about and gives an example on um, narrative being so effective that usually, for example, if you're reading a book that you really like, um, you're more likely to remember um, that character and what they were going through versus what you were going through during the time of you reading that novel. So it really places an emphasis on um, the validity of narrative. And the final um, section of the chapter talks about real world constraints. And some of the examples are the two biggest uh, real, world, real world constraints that we're going to be facing are going to be time and budget. Uh, so basically they're talking about um, how much time you have to conduct your research or collect your data and what kind of budget you're going to be um, having to work with. So a lot of times you're going to have to find the balance between how much time you have and how much money you have in order to uh, collect the data that you're going to need.